Brett Thielman. I'm an architect. I'm an architectural consultant. I'm a troubleshooter. Born and raised on Long Island. Okay. Been working in Manhattan since 1987. And it's actually a cabinet maker's hammer. The work is not done here, but this is a major, major step forward. My reaction is, uh, this is nuts. It's really, really crazy. You never know, you know, you, you never know who your neighbors are, right? Please note that this content is for adults only, viewer discretion advised. If you haven't yet, hit the subscribe, like and share. Everyone and welcome back to another live stream with me, Gizella K. Ooh, let me just stop my presentation right there. We're not ready for the next page yet. <laughs> Happy Friday to you. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time here with me as we go over yet another layer. As you know, we're going layer by layer. The more we find out, the more I'm adding to my presentation. So if there's some stuff you've seen already, then it's a refresher on that stuff for you. But there's always new things added. OK, and if you've never seen those episodes, well, then this is going to be quite the deep dive. <laughs> uh, Rando from Iowa, welcome and thank you so much for being a member for eight months. Thank you to all my patrons. Uh, Patreon is a great source of support. Thank you so much to all my patrons and for everyone who's made it over there. Really appreciate it. Welcome to all my mods. If you don't know who the mods are, Grizzly moderators are uh, chatters here with a wrench next to their name and they help to moderate the chat to keep it grisly, which means keeping it kind and respectful, especially to the families of victims of crime, like including Rex Hurman's family. I'm very shocked that <laughs> the New York Post and all these, um, you know, mainstream media is like making, putting them on blast. You know what I mean? People are filming them. People are sharing not only their pictures, but now videos of them. And I'm like, shame. Oh, my word. They've been through enough. You know, a lot of gawkers right now. So let's please keep it kind. Uh, you never know who's watching. And I can just imagine. I actually can't imagine. Imagine how they're feeling. Oh, my word. They went back to the house. If you didn't know, they were sitting on the porch, which is how people were filming them. But it's devastating to see. And um, Rex Human's uh, stepson was crying he was sitting there crying you know and people were filming and oh man shame it's sam thank you for being a member for eight months as well okay so are we ready for another deep dive this is part of the playlist that i've made for you on the case there could be things you missed out on for instance yesterday there was an episode which is on my it's in the video section so it wasn't a live stream it was a premiere with a criminal profiler john kelly so maybe you want to check that out if you haven't yet i think it was very interesting we discussed a whole bunch of things i made it as concise as possible for you guys of course we talk for a long time um, about all these things which would be the long island serial killer the Manaville Butcher, as Bitroff was known to some, John Bitroff, another serial killer who could be responsible for 15 or more murders too. And there's a whole lot of talk of could he have been responsible for some of the victims on Gilgo Beach. Uh, we also talked about the eastbound strangler in Atlantic City and all kinds of things like that. So if you haven't seen that, please do check it out. There will be future episodes with John Kelly as well. And yes, I did see John Kelly was also on News Nation with Brian Enton yesterday, which was awesome to see too. Susan, thank you so much. Is that coffee? Is that coffee? Yeah, I need that. <laughs> thank you so, so much. I really appreciate it. And before we dive in, I just want to say hi to one more person here. I don't want to miss the sticker. Jinxie said you and Mr. Kelly were fantastic yesterday. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jinxie. I really appreciate it. Okay. So in order to not interrupt the presentation and our deep dive too much, I'm not going to read out the stickers the whole time. I'm just letting you guys know in advance. So mods, if you can, please uh, ask Nightbot to help us. Uh, thank everyone. And if you can also, then at the end, 
I will, or in a break or something, I will also have a look at them. Gerda, thank you so much. Zar, South African Rands, really appreciated. Don't know why YouTube's not letting me put it on the screen right now. I'm trying. <laughs> thank you so much. Are we ready to deep dive? Rex Uriman, the alleged Long Island serial killer or Gilgo Beach murderer. Okay, so just a recap for those of you who don't know. He's a 59-year-old man from Massapequa Park, New York, who was arrested on, I wrote here, July 14th, because that's actually what it says officially on the court site, but we all know he was arrested, you know, swarmed on July 13th. That's what they said, right? I remember that day, because I'm like, ooh, on the 13th. But anyway, and charged with the murders of Amber Costello, Megan Waterman, and Melissa Bartholomew. He's also the prime suspect in the murder of Maureen Brainard Barnes. So that seems to be a matter of time. Now, I don't know if you saw my YouTube short that I made, I think, yesterday. But it's something that just hit me yesterday is, wait a minute, from that probable cause affidavit, they actually said three out of the four victims were found in burlap, which means there's a fourth, the fourth there, out of those four, the Gilgo four that was not in burlap. And I'm like, that's interesting. Who, what, where? And it's actually the one who's... Um, not been added as a charge, which is Maureen Brainard Barnes. She was apparently not found in burlap. Now that's pairing two bits of information, the probable cause affidavit, and then emails I got from locals saying that it was Maureen not found in the burlap. And I'm like, whoa, because we always know it as the Gilga four, all four found in burlap, right? So thank you uh, so, so much to everyone who sends me emails, all the locals, all the videos, all the things you're sending me, I really, really appreciate it. This is about another case, but I did not see that yet. Uh, thank you so much, Lily. I really appreciate it. Okay, so you can see that um, I was also confused because they said he's arraignment and then there's a conference. I'm like, but surely he was arraigned already. So they say here on the site on the 14th of July, uh, he had his arraignment. Okay, and then the next day that he'll be in court is actually on August 1st, which I believe is Tuesday. So Laurie Vallodaybell is going to be sentenced on Monday, the 31st. I hope I'm correct on my days, but I think so. And then on Tuesday... Uh, Rex will be back in court and they say it's a conference and they're going to discuss the, the discovery and just the, the, the investigation, all sorts of things, right? Okay. So I agree one thing quickly. Caroline says, I think it's harsh and unrealistic to think the wives always know something's off. People cheat all the time and keep it secret from the spouse. This is even easier than an affair to keep secret. Exactly. And I mean, a lot of times in these cases, if it's a a killer, an alleged serial killer or a serial killer, um, then the wife might suspect, you know, that their husband's shady or cheating or something, but they don't suspect that they're a serial killer, right? Okay, so, and I mean, we know he had a vault for all his guns, but I mean, he was a hunter. He was also a bear hunter, which I was like, sorry, what now? You, that's probably why he went to Alaska so many times. He's hunting licenses, which we've looked at before a little bit. Um, three of them were for Alaska. So I'm like, well, yeah, it was probably where he went bear hunting. And, you know, because people are saying you wouldn't need all those types of guns for duck hunting only because he had almost 300 guns, 92 licenses. But for bear hunting, probably needed a whole bunch, right? Okay, so his next court date will be on August 1st. If they're going to stream that or show it to us, of course, we'll have a look at it. And then the details of his charges, he's got three first-degree murder charges and three second-degree murder charges for three out of the four uh, Gilgo four victims, which we've just um, listed right about this. I just wanted to show you this, and they do say serial killing in the charges. Okay, and that's Rex Hureman, if you've not seen him before. So, I'm sure by now you have, right? Okay, so Gilgo Beach Murders, or uh, no, now known as the Long Island Serial Killer, Lisk, and there's also the Lisk podcast, which is very good, so Lisk is a lot easier to say as well. Um, but these... This is a little map, which we've looked at before as well, of all the bodies they found so far on Gilgo Beach. Could it be the work of one serial killer or two? Some people say, how can it possibly be two? Why would two be dumping bodies here? But it really is the, the perfect road with lots of bramble on, alongside the road. It's super dark, no lighting. So it could be, it could actually be the dumping grounds of more than one serial killer, which is what I was discussing in detail with John Kelly, a criminal profiler in yesterday's episode, if you missed that. Now, the ones that I've circled in yellow circles are the victims um, whose murders he's been charged with so far. And you could see with the, the four, Maureen Brainard Barnes is the one not circled yet, I would say. So 
that's what we're dealing with so far. What is Lisk Long Island Serial Killer? So that's what it is. All right. Welcome, everyone. If you haven't yet, please like this video and share it to wherever, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, email to a friend. It really helps people know that I am live right now. I did let all my patrons know and I shared it on Twitter as well. So please retweet that and then people know, okay, okay, we're live. We're talking about this because I don't really want people to miss the layers we do because we kind of build each time on it. It really helps if you already have seen the last one. But if you haven't, don't worry, we're going over this. Okay, it will be interesting nonetheless. I hope so. So Rex Andrew Hureman. I was like, what is that second name? It's Andrew. Rex Andrew Hureman is his name. Now we're going to quickly go over here how he describes himself and where are we getting this from? From that interview that he did with that uh, Bonjour Productions, uh, that Frenchman that interviewed him in New York in his office. And I just wanted to go over that as well and just look at it one more time. Not the interview, I'm now kind of transcribing it for you, picking up very interesting bits, especially with his Google searches. He was really looking at Long Island Serial Killer, Long Island Serial Killer update. Why have they not caught the Long Island Serial Killer and all that kind of stuff, right? And then when he went on dates, we've heard now from a few where he was like, have you heard of the of the Gilgo Beach murders? Do you know about the Long Island Serial Killer? He liked to talk about it. So in my mind, someone like this could be thinking, if I ever get caught, well, this interview will be analyzed. <laughs> I don't know if it's that premeditated, but if he ever thought, huh, one day I'm going to be so notorious and they're going to analyze this. And so maybe there's a little bit of, you know, hidden language because he sure says very interesting things in this interview that make you go, hmm, what is he trying to say? And also <laughs> a lot of people believe that the interviewer works for the FBI and I can't say that I'm like, no, I'm like, maybe <laughs> because the questions were very interesting. Very interesting choice of questions. As you know, I interview quite a lot of people. And so I analyze the questions people ask and I'm like, huh, very interesting series of questions there. Okay. So, wow. Krista says she was acting very rude or aggressively. You're talking about the wife. She has every right to feel like that right now. People are completely invading her privacy. Of course, she's angry. It's devastating. I don't blame her at all. Okay. So, Yes, um, let's, con sorry, I'm saying yes because someone says, uh, JW, thank you for verifying that RH was a hunter. I wondered if that was a facade. He was actually a hunter. And a lot of people have said because of the date that he went on around 2015, that lady, I think her name's Nikki Bass. I hope I get it right every time. Nikki Bass, right? She was interviewed on Hidden to Crime. I think she was on News Nation with Como. And she did a few interviews. She's also on TikTok, of course. That's where I first um, saw her talk about her interaction with Rex Hureman. I mean, that's him asking, you know, um, have you heard of the Gilgo Beach murders and all of that? Um, what is my point? Wait, very fine. I wondered if it was a facade. Ah, oh, lost my train of thought on the 2015 lady date. I've got to focus on my notes, man. What was I going to say? <laughs> I don't know. And I'm very sorry. I'll get back to it. My brain is very busy with this right now. So how does he describe himself? Let's get into it. And if I think of that thought again later, I'll remind you. <laughs> okay. How, how does he describe himself? An architect, okay, or an architectural consultant. He says, I'm an architect, an architectural consultant, so not or, and, and. He's quite um, overconfident, I would say, All right? The way that he talks and describes himself. He said, I'm a troubleshooter, which <laughs> Rochelle Pronzo said the other day, or troublemaker, troubleshooter, born and raised on Long Island been working in Manhattan since 1987. So he was 24 years old or so then. He said out of the city, arch the, the out of city architects are a little afraid of the city. And he does this quite a bit during this interview where he says, oh, all these other architects are just so scared, but I'm not like, not only can I help them, but I can also teach them and I'll just handle the big stuff basically. Right. I don't know. I don't think that architects are like shaking in their boots about Ooh, Manhattan, because I think if one is going to be an architect, you would just dream of being one in Manhattan, New York, right? <laughs> okay. So he said, part of my job became educate the city. 
oh, now you're educating the whole city <laughs> on how it works around here. Like, my word, this guy. <laughs> I could watch this 10 more times and be like, damn, look at this. Like, I analyze lots of things in it, which I'm sure you do too, right? Anyway, so then he said, um, he, rem he did mention the architectural recession in the early 90s as well, which someone reminded us of that the other day in chat. And he himself mentioned it and he's like, we're all looking for where to work, who to work for, all that. And what's interesting about that is then people speculate, well, what was he doing? If he's a serial killer, did he start killing already in the 90s? Or, I mean, he was born in 63, actually, it was September 63. Everyone says 64, but when you look at the ancestry records, it seems to be 63. Anyway, and so if he was born in 63 i mean yeah this guy could have been busy in the 80s already for all we know so if he's in a recession could that have been some sort of a i don't know a catalyst speculatively you never know we just don't know how many cases could be tied to this guy and we also don't know could it be four the gilgo four <laughs> that'll be interesting if it's underwhelming which we hope it is because it's a really terrible thing to think of how many people are murdered uh weekly yearly it's it's scary so to to be you know i'm not hoping that it's like oh my word 100 to 200 or something it's just you just never know okay so he said um he talked about this the, his first paying client and it was this guy who was standing in line waiting to talk to a clerk and he said he didn't know what he was doing i'm getting impatient and the way that he says that you can just imagine i think rex <laughs> would be more of an impatient type although the next thing he does is explain how extremely patient he is okay so i'm just going to tell you as well we're going over this interview transcription then we're going deep dive into the timeline and kind of every phase of his life that's what we're doing today and looking also at what his high school classmates said, uh, said about him what kind of hunting did he do as we just mentioned things like that okay so if it appears that i've been in the rabbit hole i have <laughs> i'm still in it hi <laughs> okay so he said didn't know what he was doing i'm getting impatient and this became his first paying client he says the biggest reason that people contact him is because they're overwhelmed by the city by the size and complexity of the building department sometimes i wonder if some of the victims that he chose we're also, or if he's describing the victims here, like they're just so overwhelmed, he's just going to show them around and help them around, you know, type of thing. Uh, it could be interesting. We don't know if he had interactions with those victims many times before. I mean, with Amber Costello, we know that he had seen her before. And John Kelly gave us a very interesting thought process as well, saying that, because I was saying, well, maybe... He told him, don't bring your phone because he knows that he'll be tempted to reach out to the family and taunt them. But John Kelly gave an interesting uh, bit there yesterday by saying, what if he actually said, don't bring your phone along. And to those that brought their phone along, he's like, okay, now I'm going to taunt your family. You know, it could be something like that. <laughs> yes. Okay. So let's go here quickly so the biggest reason people contact him is because they are overwhelmed by the city you know john wayne gacy i know we've made comparisons a little bit before but he used to do that he's done that uh, he did that with a few victims where he'd be like i'll show you around that was in chicago he's like i'll drive you around just hop in the car let's go on a tour of the city so i just don't know you know we don't know that right now there's obviously a lot of gaps and that's what we're trying to do here is the whole time layer by layer fill in the gaps and i'm gonna do a comprehensive timeline and you're part of this work in progress um, or you're a witness of it because as we go and as more information comes out we're just going to keep filling it in i don't know how many pages this thing will be eventually okay so sorry if i'm missing any of your comments here i will i always watch the replays so i will Check out the chat replay to see what you guys are all saying later because I can't keep up with everyone. So he said, I do troubleshooting, architectural troubleshooting. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> he has to specify troubleshooting, architectural troubleshooting. He said, I have my own staff. Most architects will go to an outside consultant called an expediter. He describes having an advantage over other architects because of his in-house resources. And he said, where I exceed, that is. like, 
So he's, he's got this vibe of I'm better than everyone else. You know, the narcissistic vibe we might so often see in these cases where he's like, I, <laughs> you know, am better than them, less scared than them. I can do the work that they can't do. You know, that's why I say overconfidence. Let me know what you think, um, especially in the comments as well. So I can read that too afterwards. Uh, Humphrey says a bit of a grandiose personality, Rex says. Yes. Uh, and then he said, I can tell them what I feel and what I think they should do. And I do that. Now, imagine if he's actually talking about his victims here. <laughs> you know, if he's projecting a little bit. He's talking about architecture. But if you listen carefully and you just think, wow, imagine if he's talking about architecture, his projects, the same way as he talks about his victims, which he could also call his projects the same way BTK did. Right? So that's what I was thinking when I rewatched this. He said an expediter uh, can't do that because they work at the pleasure of the city. I know. Okay. Make of that what you will. When asked what are the most important qualities to have to have a job like this, he said patience. Patience. And I don't like to use the word tolerance, but sometimes you have to. And it's not just with the city. It's also with the clients because most clients, they don't understand what I have to do, why I have to do it, what it takes to get done. And when you're dealing with someone in the city, whether it be a clerk at the counter who has to enter data entry, or if I'm dealing with a borough commissioner of Manhattan, you need the patience because who knows what the person before you did. Sometimes they have very bad days. <laughs> Again, I'm speculating, but imagine if he's actually talking about sex workers and about victims oh, that'll be interesting also look at his hand like damn that one finger is not right but a little bit broken huh and we can already speculate what he's allegedly done with those hands you know those are the the hands of an alleged killer a serial killer he would obviously just say this from building or whatever also, uh, Cassandra says, what background does the brother have? Um, not too sure. Uh, I, can't, I can't remember. I read up on him a bit. I'm kind of leaving him in peace because otherwise everybody's, well, they already, you know, the internet's already like, go, go for the brother. There's some interesting things like him uh, apparently hitting the neighbor over the head with a steel pipe and maybe burning things in the backyard. That's all rumor, but you just never know. I wondered if he also was so tall, you know, and I read today that he he looks like Rex's twin just about. They say they're both very tall. They look very similar. And this was from an article I read about high school classmates of Rex's. So that's interesting. OK, so he said, I've actually gone to the commissioner's office, sat down in his waiting area at 11 or 1130 in the morning. And at 5 p.m. he hollers out, is Rex still there? That's how long I've waited. So he really likes to show off how patient he can be. And in the context of a serial killer, imagine it. You would have to be patient. You know what I mean? You can't just go around killing every day type thing if he is calculated and organized. There's many times where they have those cool off periods, right? So he's, he's very proud of his patience. Uh, so he described a day that he solved a problem. He said, meet with the commissioner of Manhattan building department and I start negotiating how to do this, you know, cause he's just the guy, he's the puppet master, right? He can just pull all the strings everywhere he goes. And he said, and I got very creative. So this became a mixing of building code, negotiation, the use of modern products to achieve all of this. Again, this might mean nothing. It could just be pure architecture talk, but I just wonder. And I'd love to know how this interview came about. I know that um, Antoine, who interviewed him, conducts a lot of uh, interviews around New York. But I'm like, how did you find, I've emailed him. How did you think, uh, like Rex, how did you <laughs> find him and want to interview him specifically? I would love to know, right? Maybe they just go down Fifth Avenue and just find people. But it's still interesting. And that Rex was like, okay. I think he was loving it, honestly. It looked like he was absolutely just glowing you know attention was on him something i think he's always wanted right i mean when he was arrested he's like is it in the news that's what he said to the jail keepers apparently okay so when he said um the use of modern products to achieve all of this wow he looked really um braggy there 
very arrogant they when i'm like huh what are you trying to say bro okay so then he said it became a mix of art and science and the understanding of the code to make it work and that's what i applied to each job which is why at home i have an extensive library of obsolete books and people want to know why do i have a plumbing code from the 1970s when I do work for either attorneys or have to look up something historical, I need the reference for that point in time. Now, I find it interesting how he says, and people want to know. That's kind of what got me going down this rabbit hole of what is he really trying to say? You know, is he speaking a little bit double meaning? Because sometimes these types of dudes do that, you know? So it's in plain sight, you know what I mean? And he's like, and people want to know. I mean, who in the hell at that point wanted to know what kind of obsolete books you have in your house? The house that really doesn't look like an architect's house. <laughs> you know? He's like, and people want to know. Like, I don't, <laughs> I don't think one person wanted to know at that point. Now people want to know. That's why I'm thinking. Was he projecting, like, one day if people see this. If I ever get caught, they're going to see this and analyze it. Well, here we are. Here we are. He said, I think it's taught me. Like, so the question was, what lessons have you learned from this job? And he said, I think it's taught me more about how to understand people. Because dealing with the technical aspects is something a person can learn. Again, very confident about his supposed people skills, which he really lacked in high school from what we're hearing, right? So, for instance, uh, Ted, Bundy had, uh, Ted Bundy had a speech impediment. And he would listen to the radio at night and practice accents and practice to correct that. And I mean, in the end, he was so eloquent and educated. You know what I mean? They like overcompensate sometimes to get control, to feel powerful. And so saying it's taught me more about how to understand people, implying maybe he didn't understand people before, right? Because dealing with the technical aspects is something that any person can learn. So again, he's better than everyone else because he's got a very, very special skill. He said, but it's the people, how they're, they're also different. And how you deal with the people is one of the more interesting aspects that have come out of this. So, okay. <laughs> All right. He said, for, for what I do, you need to have so many tools in the toolbox. And like, yeah, literally and figuratively, dude. Mm, the architecture and the serial killing. Just remember he's innocent or proven guilty in a court of law. Right now he's facing six charges, three first degree murder, three second degree murder for three out of the four Gilga four victims serial killing charges so we're just speculating okay so he said one of the things i learned from my father was furniture building he was an aerospace engineer and built satellites but he made like it's just small he was an aerospace engineer and like he built satellites like you know imagine being like like my dad was an astronaut Psh, no biggie anyway you know like he almost brags through his dad as well and i really want to know if anyone knows I mean, was his dad really an aerospace engineer? He could have been. We know he was in the Air Force. He was an aerial navigator. And maybe after that, he became an aerospace engineer. But like, damn, that's like <laughs> pretty high up there. Like aerospace engineer and built satellites. And then built furniture at home. And he said, and I still build it in the same exact workshop. Which tells me he is sentimental about his dad's mark on that house on keeping things as they are to a certain extent. And I mean, maybe to a big extent, actually, because they said it's like a hoarder's house, very cluttered. We don't know if he's the hoarder or if it's actually his family, like his wife, we don't know, but it could be him just based on what he's saying there. You know, he's, he's, he's kept it like that and he still builds furniture in the same exact work, workshop. Now, I'd love to know if he actually builds furniture as well. That <laughs> would be so interesting. Like, does he, what did he build? Welcome, welcome to all the members and welcome everyone. If you're only joining now, I hope you'll watch from the beginning again later. But stay with us now as we go down this rabbit hole. So this is just analyzing the interview that Rex Heuerman did with uh, that Bonjour Productions with Antoine. Okay, which has since been taken off their channel, which I completely understand. PR wise, I suppose, like, oh, damn, we interviewed a serial killer. <laughs> Allegedly, alleged serial killer. Okay, so, of course, we all know about this cabinet maker's hammer that he talked about when asked if you could be one object or use one tool to describe you know how to be successful in what you do he said well there's many right the many tools in the toolbox and he said okay okay just one he's going to pick one 
And he said, I have one tool that's pretty much used in every job. And again, imagine if he's talking about the victims just for a second. We don't know that yet, if, there's, if this was used. We know he looked up a lot of sadistic stuff. It seems like he kept his victims for quite a few days or maybe even weeks. He contacted Melissa Barthelemy's family for about a month and a half. About eight times, seven or eight times, her sister. And then said, I finally killed your sister. So did he keep some victims for the whole summer while he was fa his family was away? Or just a few days? I just don't know. But the thing is, we just don't know, you know, remember the toolbox killer and all that? Just don't know how much he tortured people and how much he may have enjoyed that. Very sickening. Uh, thank you, Miranda writes. Oh, okay, yes, okay, so uh, M. Kenny says his dad worked at Grumman, okay. And was he an aerospace engineer and did he build satellites? Grumman. An aircraft engineering, I mean, that I know the name, yeah. An aircraft engineering corporation. Did he build satellites though? I just feel like the reason I ask is because it seems to me like Rex would be the type to really embellish, right? Okay, so he said, I have one tool that's pretty much used in every job and it's actually a cabinet maker's hammer. It's persuasive enough when I need to persuade something. And then Antoine said something or someone and said something. <laughs> and the way he said it was very interesting, of course. And it always yields excellent results. And at the end of the project, whatever piece of furniture or whatever I'm working on, it always helps it come out beautifully. That's what he did, right? Interesting. I just find it interesting. If later we find out more about this, then this whole deep dive will be interesting in hindsight. You know, if it's like, oh my word, he really did use hammers and things. And we know they said there was a variety of weapons in the house that wouldn't be classified quite as weapons, right? Engineer says they did build satellites. Okay, maybe he really was an aerospace, aerospace engineer and built satellites. Yes. Okay, so he said, sometimes I have to be the heavy framing hammer. Other times I'm the lightweight hammer just to nudge things along. Okay. So, <laughs> you're seeing posing. Posing for a selfie. I think I've got more pictures, actually. Yeah, Stefan says, or oh, whatever I'm working on. So they, <laughs> Antoine said, you know, the interviewer, you know what time it is now? It's like, selfie time. And we all know <laughs> Rex likes taking a good selfie. Oh, my word. I don't know how he thought he's going to entice woman like that but okay the selfies he took not this one i mean the ones we've seen from the probable cause affidavit oh man but look at him here like this look on the left that's just a very different look from the guy the little charming people say i must say charming but you know what i mean when he's just very charismatic and just like braggy the, this this guy means business right here right <laughs> he's got his sunnies on now and he's ready to pose and then Ant Antoine actually said to him, can you smile? And he's like, it is. <laughs> he was like, it is. Okay, it is. So it is smiling. You are smiling. Okay, sir. So this would be him smiling, apparently. And also, Antoine's on the right-hand side. <laughs> and I noticed his jackets and I'm like, is he a grizzly? <laughs> now, it's not part of the brand we have here, okay? But I'm like, is he a grizzly? <laughs> Antoine, are you a grizzly? Can you come say hi to us, please? <laughs> yes. Oh, Van says, I hope Antoine's dog is okay. Norman was the dog's name. Rex was like, hello, Norman. <laughs> Rex looked a little awkward, which is not surprising, huh? If he was awkward around animals, being such a hunter, bragging about his hunting, we're going to get to that, okay? All right. Okay, Brandy, I will check that out. So much conflicting information about that cell phone. And as you know, I'm trying to watch everything and listen to everything, which is also why we're building this timeline. Now, this you saw last time. If you didn't, you got to check out my previous episode. Okay, it's on the playlist, the previous live stream on this case. Quick one, Rex born in 1964, right? And so he's arrested in 2023. And actually, I'm not going to go over all of this again, because we literally went through this. I don't want to bore you guys now. For those who want to go over this slowly, then just check out that previous episode. But we're going to go a little layer deeper now, okay? So don't worry if you're like, no, no, don't go on. We don't want to miss it. Don't worry. We're going in now. You see? <laughs> we're going, yeah, timeline time. <laughs> okay. So 
also later I'm going to be interviewing. You remember the um, Ronald Anthony Burgos Aviles case? Remember that timeline guy? Detective Garcia? The compilation guy? <laughs> the lead detective in the case. I'll be interviewing him and Detective Reyes later today, as in in the next few hours. Two and a half hours from now. <laughs> Very excited to bring that to you sometime this weekend. Now, let's get into this. 1963 to 1975. We all thought he was born in 1964. That's what it said on the paperwork initially. But now when you look at like family trees and all kinds of records and you're like, oh, I think he was born in 1963 is what it says. Now, disclaimer, I'm not putting any of the sisters here to expose them or something. I'm sure they're like, oh, no, like don't want to be associated with their brother at all. But we need to know, like, how was this house like? <laughs> We're going to find out so much about Rex's upbringing, how he was formed, who is he, what happened, you know, when did he decide to kill? Because no, at some point they decide, you know what I mean? At some point they make that decision. If they do have a lot of trauma, which many serial killers do, then at some point they decide what they're going to do with their trauma, which is uh, inflicted on others, which is the worst, dumbest decision you can make, right? Okay, Gerda says that's super exciting. Yeah. So, age 0 to 12 is what we're looking at now. I do not have a picture of Dolores, Rex's mother. But this is Theodore. He was born in 1925 and he died in 1975. Dolores is actually no longer alive despite all the articles saying that she is. When you go look at family trees, you know, and you look at... Ooh, there we go. Sorry, I tapped my mic. If you look at the family trees and you look at a little bit more formal records, it seems to me that she passed away in 2016. Okay. So, Brandy, I acknowledged your message. I will look at it. Not right now, though. Right now we're doing this. Thank you so much. You can also email me, grizzlytruecrime at gmail.com. Anytime if you guys want to like relay information to me, grizzlytruecrime at gmail.com. All right. So, he's got two sisters that we know of so far. I'm saying we because lots of people are now <laughs> sending me things as grizzlies that we don't know of so far. But there's rumor, there's two rumors. The one rumor is that he actually has three sisters. And another rumor is that he has another brother. That still has to be cleared up. But so far, there's, there's, a, there's four kids in the house, right? When Rex is born in 1963, actually it's him and two or three older sisters. So Dolores, Phyllis, Dolores is 12 years older than Rex, Phyllis 4 years older. It's also rumored that one of them lived like right adjacent, like across the road, because there's two properties associated with Rex's name when you search it on that same avenue. One is like just across the road and apparently this one of the sisters lives there or lived there or something like that. Okay, and then there's Craig. So Rex was born September 13th, 1963. I don't know what star sign that is, but for everyone who's interested in star sign, now you know. Now you can look it up. I mean, actually, is he Virgo? Is he? Because one of his emails was Virgo. I have no idea. Can someone look it up and tell me? <laughs> so, well, I'll look it up later. And then Craig, his younger brother, was born in 1966, three years younger than Rex, and he got married in October of 1997. They say they look very alike, both very tall. Some in high school say they look like twins. He got married then, but now when they say in that uh, South Carolina property, his girlfriend was there. So he's obviously not married anymore, I guess, and he had a girlfriend there. It is Virgo. Okay, you guys are saying Virgo. One of his email addresses on that probable cause affidavit was Vir something Virgo. So that's interesting. Okay. So this is what we know so far about the family dynamics, the structure, just the structure, not the dynamics. We don't even know about that yet, but over time, more information will come out. Why are we interested in it? Well, I'm interested in the psychology uh, of, you know, like how a serial killer is formed. Like, how do they do this? Like, <laughs> you know, I find, I've always found it very interesting. If you've read any of my books, it's the same format. I, did, I used to do the same format. Like, let's go back. Let's look at exactly like this, <laughs> from 0 to 10, from 10 to 12, all that. Let's look at all, all the phases of life and what we can fill in, right? Okay, so here you can see a little newspaper clipping of his dad, Theodore J. Hureman, 
They say second lieutenant Killian, son of Mr. and Mrs. Okay, that's a different person. And second lieutenant Hurman, son of Mr. and Mrs. William G. Hurman of 14 Chapin Avenue. Merrick recently were graduated as aerial navigators at Salmon Field, Monroe. Okay. Now they wear the silver wings of navigators and gold bars of second lieutenant in the air corps. So there's that. Theodore Hurman, born July 18th, 1925. He had one brother and one sister from what I could find. He married Dolores Soka Socha, which is a Slavic origin surname. I had a look, I had a deep dive. Now, where's that from? It sounds very unfamiliar, right? Um, maybe it's like, are there lots of so Soka Sochas in New York? I don't know. Um, but married Dolores on January 18th, 1950. He got married at age 24. I looked at that because I'm like, you know, if Rex like looked up to his dad, Lost his dad at age uh, 12, actually then. People say 11 based on knowing knowing when Rex was born, but now we know the date, September, right, in 1963. So, actually, we've got to calculate it all again. <laughs> but anyway, uh, when we look at that, I was wondering if Rex also got married at the same age, for instance. If he did, I'd be like, oh, interesting. They had their first child in 1951, so getting married in 1950. First child, 1951, you know. Normal, normal story there and then they had children 1959 1963 and 1966 he died November 29th of 1975 I also look at dates in case it's significant like imagine every year if on the day his father died he goes out to hunt a victim or something that would be interesting then but I couldn't find anything like that then Dolores Hurman born May 25th of 1930 in Queens, New York, I also find that, you know, I mean, it doesn't have to be of interest at all, given the area. It's just that on the phone, when he was taunting victims, he was talking about Queens. He brought up Queens. So I'm just like, oh, that's interesting. Uh, he, oh, she got married on January 18th, 1950. And apparently she died. There's even a like specific date. Yes, the father died at 50 years old. I don't know of what. I would love to know how did the father die? What happened? Um, so his his mother apparently died on November 29th of 1975. Is that true? Wait, not 1975. That's not correct. Wait. That's not right. It's 2016. That's a typo. <laughs> of 2016. She died in 2016. Okay, sorry about that. At age 86-ish? Wait. That would make sense. I just want to double check because I, I just put it on my other slide there. And I have it in my memory now. So let's double check this. Yeah, that would make sense. In 2016, November 29th of 2016. I'm like, November. Okay, so also not around a date that he would go after victims or something, right? But so people saying she's still alive in 93. I don't think that's true based on what I found today, right? Oh, interesting. Okay, as well. He's, he's, <laughs> I'm just checking a comment saying his dad was 25 years older than his mom. His dad was born in 1925 and his mom in 1930. Five years? Five years. Okay. I oh, thank you, Liz. We continue on. Hope you're enjoying the deep dive. On we go. Work in progress. So here is his at uh, his gravestone. Theodore J. Hurman, second lieutenant, U.S. Air Force, World War II, July 18th, 1925 to November. There we go. That's the November 29th, 1975. That's when he died. She died in 2016. So I've got to get that date correct. I obviously copy pasted from there and didn't correct the date, but it's <laughs> 2016. Okay, she died. So that was. Wow, 2016. I mean, that was quite a while ago as well. And I wonder if he... Did he stop? Did he carry on killing? We just don't know at this point, right? He's actually buried at... What is this one called? It's seven miles from his house. It's not Arlington. I'll have to find it again. We looked at that last time as well. Okay. They did not die on the same day. That was a typo. <laughs> Okay, so 1975, Rex was 12, Craig was 9, Phyllis was 16, Dolores was 24, and the mother was 45. So, we're looking at Rex, of course. I'm just seeing what age was everyone, okay? 
I really don't know how his father died and I'd really like to know. You know, it would be very interesting. Now I'm showing this belt again, which was shown at a lot of, you know, well, there's press conferences in when they got the new task force and they showed this belt that was actually found because the, the, the Gilgo four, they were, they were bound remember. And one of these belts was found on one of the victims and they said, does anyone recognize this? Now it looks like it could be HM and which I would say, could it be Hurman or is it a WH for his grandfather's initials? Because Rex's grandfather was WH initials. So could it be that? I also saw on Reddit people saying that this is an accordion strap. Okay. To me, it looks like a belt, but if you can recognize what this really is interesting because <laughs> they don't show us much of it. Um, I just want to go here again. If you look at the dad there, he obviously was in the, in the band, right? So I don't know if it could be his grandfather's and then his father had it and then he used those belts or what, right? Okay. So we continue on. Now we're looking at 1975 to 1981. Rex was aged 12 to 18. So Rex was 12 years old when his father died. We do not yet know how his father died. Theodore was an Air Force aerial navigator and from age 19. Rex said that he was an aerospace engineer and built satellites and he could have been right between the age of 25 and 50. He absolutely could have been that. Rex said that his father built furniture in the home and Rex still does this in the same workshop, sentimental, described as a hoarder. He graduated from Burner High School in 1981. Now in the articles that have come out recently, uh, it's a lot of classmates speaking from the 1983 class. So it's not his classmates. I haven't yet seen, except for Billy Baldwin, which I've quoted here at the bottom, saying something from his class. But the class of 1983, they've got a lot to say, which means Rex must have stood out a little bit, huh? See, D says, I've read a couple of articles advising, but this is media. You know what I mean? <laughs> it might not be factual. It goes around. Once it's out there, once it goes out there 20 million times. You know what I mean? That's the thing. This is why we like to dig, because from what I'm finding, she's no longer alive. She passed away in 2016, which I think would be interesting to add to the psychology of Rex Hureman as a big picture. So yes. Okay. Keep that in mind. That's why we dig <laughs> to vet information. All right. We want to find credible sources, right? Okay. And the more, the more we have and the more you guys find, please do send it. I love seeing like divorce records, birth records, death records, what happened, medical records, genealogy, family trees, all of that, right? All the things. We want to find all the facts at the end of the day. That's what we want to find. We want all these bullet points to be as many facts as possible. Of course, we, there's a lot of gaps in his timeline and there's a lot of room for speculation and we just don't know so much, but I'm sure over time we will know a lot more. So that's the point. Vicky says so far, all reports state exactly. I'm counteracting that based on um, genealogical information. Okay. And so, graduated class of 91, his classmates describe him as a reclusive teen, as a mama's boy. One of the articles said that his mother was very controlling, which I'm not sure if that's what they took from someone saying he was a mama's boy or if that's how the person, the classmate perceived it. But Rex was very worried about getting back home to his mother, which to me would make sense because his father died. You know, like I have to get home to my mother, I have to get home to my mother. So maybe... Maybe she was not really coping with the grief. We just don't know. Um, anyway, they say he, he was, they said, okay, when he grew up, the, the goofy glasses were gone, but he still had that mop of hair. Now, Billy Baldwin said, Burner High School, Massapequa, New York class of 1981. Married, two kids, architect, average guy, quiet, family man, mind boggling. Massapequa was in shock. 23 of me strikes again, question mark, question mark. So there he said class of 91, because you'll see now with the articles, which I think it was the New York Post that spoke to people firsthand and they've got the article and they're saying it's the class of 93 that had a reunion and they were reflecting on this guy from the class of 91, Rex, right? Now that you can see is also kind of like 
uh, broken telephone. Just the information is being passed around so much that it ends up being Rex was actually class of 1983. But he was apparently the class of 1981, which makes sense. And the class of 1983 is talking about him now. Okay. So he was described as a victim with a mean streak. I mean, damn. That's one way to describe serial killers. Usually, normally, they would have been a victim of some kind of abuse, trauma. Usually, it's quite severe as well. But abuse, trauma, bullying, something. You know? But anyway, a victim with a mean streak whose home life was difficult and school life was worse. This is what classmates from the class of, 90, of, of 83 are saying. Now, we don't know why exactly his home life was difficult. Besides, of course, his father dying. But even from before his dad died, they say his dad was very hard on them, which would make sense if he was in the Air Force, in the military, right? And if he had very high standards, he'd be like discipline, you know? <laughs> Especially at that time. Okay. <laughs> Top Schlager, don't get me started. <laughs> I'm actually, my ancestry is German, so I also want to say Hoyermann, but then... Yeah, in America they say human, so I'm saying it like that, okay? <laughs> because my audience is majority American, but I know. Hoya mon! My name is Gisela. I mean, yeah, German ancestry. So, <laughs> I feel you. Okay, so moving on, they say, He was a loner and a target. He was everybody's punching bag. He would take it and walk away. I've seen him push to his limit. And I wrote, I seen him, because that's how they quoted him. I've seen him push to his limit, said John Parisi. I mean, bullying is not okay. Bullying has devastating consequences. Some people end their own lives. Some people start torturing other people. Some people, I don't know, are just completely traumatized their whole life. Bullying is not okay. There's a big problem with bullying in the world, right? Especially at school age. It's horrible. We saw the same with uh, Brian Koberger's stories, you know, different type of case, but still. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Martini Kelly. You're like 1981. Yes, high school, 1981. Thank, thank you. Okay. And so imagine that he was everybody's punching bag. Doesn't that suck if you think of the age they're describing? Because it's between... 1975 and 81 his dad died in 1975 so he lost his father he's clearly upset about that well i'm just actually i'm speculating but just imagine it he lost his father struggling at school they say home life's difficult and people are targeting him and bullying him that's not okay again we can empathize with any of these serial killers as children but we draw the line the empathy must stop at the line at which where they decided to start killing people right but one can look at their childhoods and be like, damn, well, that's harsh. And I'm sure that more is going to come out, right? Okay. And so they say in sixth grade, age 12, when he lost his dad, a group of students had singled out the tall, awkward boy and tried to beat him up. After being stopped by a teacher, they tortured him verbally. But in high school, Mr. Human grew larger and more menacing. Now, remember how he, the neighbor said he used to brag about his size? He would always be like, I'm six foot four and 250 pounds. And you remember how speculatively now his victims are all petite women? I mean, uh, the psychology was formed there, you know, in school. And then he, when he grew, it's just like, okay, now I'm bigger than everybody. Now I've got the power type of thing. But he became pretty sadistic from what we hear, right? Okay. And so, somebody here said, um, I was really, oh, Mr. Parisi again. I was really scared of him. He was the type of guy, if he snapped, he could really hurt you, Mr. Parisi said. He was disillusioned and he was misguided. Sounds a little unhinged, right? You had to be very careful. Those were the red flags back then, right? Not, no one would know. This is red flags for like, oh my word, he's going to be a serial killer. You just don't know that. But it's, it's a red flag in his development, right? Now, 
I put uh, the son of Sam here because I was thinking if he was starting to take a turn, which we've seen serial killers in the past do, there's a moment where they start to get inspired. They start getting mentors of the darker kind when they're like, hmm, wow, son of Sam. Okay, <laughs> same area. Span of crimes, 1976 to 1977. So that's like right after, you know, he lost his dad. Then people are all, the son of Sam is in the newspapers. He's getting lots of attention, lots of notoriety and all that. Maybe Rex saw that. You just don't know how that's also impacting him. And then we also know that he lived 2.9 miles from the Amityville Horrors House. That happened on November 13th of 1974. Just little bits to consider. It could mean nothing. We don't know if he even thought about it or saw it. But if he did, and if he was inspired by such things, that would be very interesting later. Okay, and so they also said the jocks took trips to the beach and hung out at all American hamburger driving. And Billy Baldwin said, it's really eerie to think how close the Gilga Four were to where he used to lifeguard. As in, Billy Baldwin used to lifeguard, He was, and he actually saw... Rex, we're going to go to that, uh, like, working on the beach. That was actually at Jones Beach and Tobey Beach. Hope I'm saying that right. Tobey Beach. <laughs> and he's like, whoa, that's that's pretty eerie to think of. So, you know what I mean? Like, if Rex was thinking, I'm going to show all of you. Like, I'm going to make, I don't know. I'm going to leave my mark on this beach. You know what I mean? You just don't know why he's chosen that as his dumping grounds. Of course, besides it being the perfect, very dark road. And places to put bodies that will not easily be discovered. Thank goodness for Blue, the canine, that uh, found human remains, and then more and more, oh my word. Imagine they never discovered. And that was all with uh, Shannon Gilbert's disappearance, right? So that's interesting. The jocks took trips to the beach and hung out at all America. I mean, of course the jocks would, I'm just saying. I wonder what his resentment feeling would be like towards those beaches, right? And what he what he did just hold on one second okay there we go so they caught they they said he was unathletic uncool and an outcast rex joined the drama club as a stagehand the bodies were dropped within walking distance of the school's favorite beach tobe Again, I hope I'm saying that beach right. <laughs> Sorry to the locals if I'm not. I will get it right the next time then. Within walking distance of the school's favorite beach. So school was a sore point for him. You know what I'm saying? Okay, so he was also described as nerdy and smart. He was a recluse, very quiet. You just saw him as a guy by himself. He barely spoke, said another guy called Don Offals. He was seen as weird. Someone you didn't see eye to eye with. He was a bit shy. A bit insecure, a bit uncomfortable. I wouldn't say he was an outcast, but he struggled to fit in and to find his crowd. That's what Billy Baldwin said. Right? But according to Mr. Musto, it was well known that Mr. Human had clashed with his father. See, this is the first we're hearing of that. There's some guy that was also in this high school that said, Mr. Musto, it was well known. This little snippet is from the New York Post. Okay. According to Mr. Musto, it was well known that Mr. Human had clashed with his father, who was tough on the boy for not being a go-getter. Ooh. Now, <laughs> okay, firstly, dads can be disciplined. Dads can be like, come on, man, go be a go-getter and all that. I just wonder what more we'll find out. Because we find out a lot about some serial killer childhoods. So I just don't know. Okay, but Mel Mutation says, you said Tobey, right, G? All right, okay, thank you. Just hold on. There we go. Okay, so in response, Rex acted out. He got caught after engaging in a shoplifting spree. Now, I wonder if that was about the Clementine thing or if that's when he was an adult. Because remember when we saw that Rex was pocketing clementines for children i wonder when that was how old was he then if is that the shoplifting one or is he actually a shoplifter because that would be interesting if it's more shoplifting stories right okay so 
They say, why is he getting in trouble? He's fighting with his dad, Mr. Musto said. It was common knowledge. Well, damn, fill us in. If anyone's watching this, and you're one of the people that went to school with him, and you want to tell me some information that I could share, just tell me. Because it's not common knowledge to us. But being like, why is he getting in trouble? He's fighting with his dad. It was common knowledge. Okay. Common knowledge he was fighting with his dad. So we're going to add that to the psychological profile of Rex Heuerman. We don't blame the dad. We're not blaming the dad. We're just thinking about, hmm, now how did his psychology form? Oh, thank you so much, uh, Stephen. Okay. Now, one thing that Rex enjoyed was architectural drawing class. But when classmates would try to talk to him, he didn't have the social skills to hold a conversation. Just a very weird character. So, interesting then to see how well he did then in that interview, in a way, right? To, to come across the way he did. So, that is what John Demicoli said. Demi, I hope I'm saying that right. <laughs> he just didn't want any part of it. He didn't want... A part in any sports. He didn't want any part of anything. Interesting. Rex was also known for fighting back after he was pushed past his limit. I wonder what they observed to know that he was pushed past his limit. You know what I mean? I mean, we could guess. I just mean, what did they see to say, oh, this guy's been pushed way past his limit now? Because that's bullying is just... Bullying is horrible and bullying gone way too far. Terrible. So... Okay. Then, when Rex graduated in 1981, he spent several years doing part-time cleaning and maintenance at Jones Beach and also frequented Tobe Beach. And I'm like, damn, they need to check those beaches, man. They need to check those beaches. Can, is Blue still alive? <laughs> Could they send more cadaver dogs out? Like, ooh, check from Jones Beach all the way. We'll look at the map quickly after this. 1981 to 1990, when he was age 18 to 27. Dana is contributing to the watermelon fund. Thank you so much. I must enjoy the watermelon while it's still summer, right? Thank you, Dana. <laughs> so, Rex went to study at the New York Institute of Technology on Long Island. He studied architectural technology. Then, he started his own business as an architectural consultant. So, for all of you who wondered, where did he study? You know, that's where. I was actually also wondering, like, where did he study and what, what, what? So that's what I found there. Between 1990 and 1994, aged 27 to 31, he got married in 1990. And I found out more information from these family trees and things that he was divorced uh, around 1993. And apparently the divorce was due to irreconcilable differences because of his infidelities and I even read further saying his uh, obsession with sex workers and I'm like well that makes sense <laughs> based on what we know now oh okay okay the the infidelity is already then so was he always looking for a cover life I don't know speculatively yes John Wayne Gacy was <laughs> they want a family in, in one way but they also want a cover life a lot of the time too right they really appear normal, not draw attention to themselves, which is also another reason that Rex could have kept the house the way he did. You know? Oh, thank you, Bonnie. So we've gone over this before. This is when he married his first wife. Now, I do see a lot of, I don't know how else to say it, but crap articles <laughs> out there right now, piling in all the information that can be found on someone with the name of Elizabeth Ryan. But it's like combining five different Elizabeths into one article and saying, you know, she was a tennis player and she was this and she lives there now. And she, I, we just don't know. It doesn't, I, I don't know. A lot of it seems not quite accurate. So I'm just going to chill with that information for now. If you, <laughs> if you dig a little more, I'm like, where did they come up with this crap? Like they really took a bit of this and a bit of that and a bit of that. And then they put it together and they're like, there we go. This is who the ex-wife is. I'm like, I don't think so. <laughs> anyway, so we'll, we'll get there eventually. We're just building, right? I hope you're enjoying it. It's, it's, it's what I do. <laughs> layer by layer, we go. So he got married in 1990, was divorced by 93, but then in 94, he bought his childhood home from his mother for $170,000. Now, I'm wondering, is that when he took a real sinister turn? Now, in that time, look at the, the people who were in the news at that time as serial killers. Did they inspire him at all? If he had speculatively already, the seed may have been planted. I'm just speculating with the son of Sam, the amitable horror. And then now if it's like, oh, okay, 
divorce. Like that did not work out. Okay, well now I'm going to buy my childhood home from my mother. I'm going to start my own company. And there he goes, RH Architecture Design. Maybe it's got nothing to do with it. Maybe he was just achieving. Anyway, span of crimes from the first one on, from the left is John Bitroff. Um, Bitroff. And he could be responsible for more of those Gilgo Beach bodies that are not yet tied to Rex. We discussed that at length with uh, John Kelly yesterday. So if you missed that video, check it out, okay? It's on the playlist. It's in the video section from yesterday. Then we've got, obviously, Joel Rifkin. His span of crimes were from 1989 to 1993. And all of them attacked sex workers. And then there was also this guy. Man, I should have written the name down. What is his name again? Ah, <laughs> I was like, I'll remember. <laughs> Always write it down. Michael something, I think. Do you guys know? Um, this is the thing. Lindsay says, isn't John Bitroff the guy there in the green shirt? Yeah. Oh, this is Rex here. I'm talking John Bitroff is the one in those little squares. Yeah, John Bitroff, Joel Rifkin, and that other guy. Um, I wonder if he was trying to frame him with the body parts in Van Maneville. Now, was he inspired by them or did he think, well, there's already so many of them, so they won't take notice of me. Like maybe he could also partake and they'll think it's them. You know what I mean? You just don't know what he was thinking at the time. Okay, so there's that. Wildfire says Joel Rifkin has insight into serial killers. We actually played his clip about a week ago. It's part of this playlist too. We went over an entire interview where he was actually commenting on these murders and commenting on his thinking, like how he went about things that he could change up his MO, all that kind of stuff. So if you missed that, go check it out. Now, from 94 to 97, I've still got more things to fill in. All we know is that, yes, he bought the house and he got married to... I don't know. I've, I've seen so many ways to say her name properly. Asa in 96. She's now filed for divorce, as we know. They had a daughter, one daughter in 1997, and his daughter also ended up working at his uh, architecture company. And the stepson was around seven at the time that they got married, based on what they're saying in the media now of how old he is now. Apparently he's around 33 or so now. So I think it would be his wife's son from a previous relationship is what I'm understanding. And so um, that is what we know about 94 to 97. And so now let's go to 97 to 2010 age 34 to 47. One of his employees, Mary Shell, who met Rex in 2007, said that he enjoyed describing in great detail his bear hunting trips. So it's not just duck hunting with a friend with a boat. That's what I was going to say. I told you I remember. <laughs> you remember from earlier when I couldn't remember what my train of thought? It's about him having a friend with a boat so they could go duck hunting. Because Rex told that date in 2015 something that she didn't want to share with the public because she's sharing it with the police which is a really good idea he mentioned another victim's name that she hadn't heard before and he mentioned how the killer would get the bodies there and gave another type of theory which a lot of people have speculated could be via the water right i still think it's much easier to just drive by i think he's pretty lazy <laughs> just like i think you'd just be like i'm just gonna drive there and put this there calculated sure but i just think he would do that as quick as possible it's less risk of being seen as well. But that was interesting nonetheless. And that was that thought. So there we go. <laughs> Remembered. So anyway, one of his employees yeah, said that he described in great detail his bear hunting trips, how he dressed the game and enjoyed grossing out his employees who were mostly petite women. She said when she first met him, he blushed like a shy teenage boy. Uh, she said he peddled himself to clients as a master at navigating the Big Apple's maze of building codes and zoning restrictions, which we saw him do in that interview. I like how she describes it as peddling <laughs> the clients. Okay, so peddling himself to clients. Rex once referred to a client who was approaching his office as target, as a target. And, and Mary overheard it just like, damn. Okay. That's that that would have been like, oh, wow, that's interesting. But now, given the context, it's like, oh, damn. So he never spoke of his family. Employees were aware that he had a family and eventually his daughter worked there. But during this time, he just never spoke of his family. But he loved talking about the hunting trips he, he took and what he did to the animals, right? 
He bragged to everyone about his gun collection. They all knew about the gun collection, which is very interesting that the house looks the way it did. He didn't pump much money into the house, you know what I mean? Like as an architect, he didn't pay his taxes either, but maybe that's where all the money went because I think those guns are worth somewhere between 80k and 150k, something like that, if we calculate it. If you know, let me know. But that's, I've had a few emails saying it could be anywhere there, but we just don't know. It's about 300 guns, right? 92 licenses, all kinds. So they say 50 to 150k, something like that. Maybe he used his money that he wasn't paying taxes on to do, to have that precious gun vault with a, the, yeah, like a, a thick vaulted door and the cement walls and the everything, which the commissioner said was not a soundproof room, but it was a vault for the guns, right? I would still speculate. Could he have tortured someone in there? Sure, he could have. We're yet to learn more, right? Caroline says firearms are expensive. Yeah, that's the thing. Right on Josephine. Jo right on Josephine says he didn't value that property. Yes, guns were bucks. Like his priorities. Like he's not. He's he's not prioritizing his home or his family or anything, but guns. <laughs> sadism killing guns that's his obsessions right hunting clearly it's like in plain sight that's in plain sight based on the contrast of the house the condition of the house and then his precious man cave <laughs> okay put himself first you know you can see it so then he would frequently invite colleagues to go hunting or shooting at the range including one of my attractive co-workers that he seemed to mention the idea to every time they spoke well, that's scary apparently she didn't go because she's like that's just weird and creepy man Thank goodness she didn't go. So then, you know the Clementines I was mentioning earlier? Someone had actually said, isn't that scary to think that what he was Googling was like 10 year olds? And yet there he is in the Clementine section, stealing Clementines, probably, maybe wanting to lure children. And he was looking up like chubby 10 year old too. So that's interesting. He's like, I'm going to lure them with all these Clementines or what? Ooh, scary thought. A former client said in early 2000, uh, Rex was renovating her Crown Heights property. One night she offered to drive him home to Long Island. And on a dark, see, he seemed to not drive his car to the city. He seemed to only rely on public transport from what we know so far. So one night she offered to drive him home to Long Island. On a dark, desolate route, he started talking about the Gilgo Beach mur murders and asked her if she knew about them. See, this is what he does. Now it's a pattern. Now we've got two accounts of that already. And he said, I don't know why he would use the burlap net. That's what he said to her. Why would he use the burlap? And isn't it interesting that he didn't use it on the first of the four to go missing. He used it on the next three, the burlap. Whoa. Okay. And so... He became very difficult to work with and belligerent towards other contractors. Now, this is still at the bottom here and another account from Shell who used to work with him like an employee, right? Shell said that in another particularly disturbing incident, Human was furious when a female employee bolted to another firm, renting out space in her old employer's office. This enraged him, she said, of the defection. Knowing they kept late hours, he was spotted outside the building gazing up into the second floor windows in the early evening. My colleagues' minds went quickly to his gun collection and they began locking the elevator and the doors. That's a red flag. This guy likes revenge, clearly. It's just like, don't cross me. Don't insult me. Don't humiliate me. Don't you disrespect me. You're going to get it, right? So hopefully all of them were safe, right? 2010 to 2023, we're going to have to fill in so much as we go. In 2015, we have heard that he gave his truck, the one that Amber Costello's roommate had spotted and described to the police. That truck, the one that he may have used to discard, of, uh, discard, <laughs> to discard the bodies to, to, to commit his crimes. You know, that truck he gave to his brother. The brother had moved... They've got properties in North and South Carolina. So he'd moved out there to the Carolinas after he had accidentally, negligently murdered a police officer in New York by hitting him with his car. We went into that before. Okay. So Helen says, John Kelly 
doesn't think Rex was a cutter, but he clearly enjoyed dressing his animal kills. See, that information came out yesterday. And so John Kelly and I are still talking about it. As we know, these profiles evolve, right? Things evolve. And the more we learn, the more interesting it gets. So that's why I say there will be further conversation with John Kelly. And the profile will evolve as we go. But for, for yeah, for, from what we had and from, I mean, John Kelly and his team have been working on this profile since like 2012, 2013. It's published there 2015. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, I, I want to go over it all with you. We haven't even gone over the whole profile before. So it's very interesting. Anyway, in 2015, he went on a date and asked if she knew about the Gilgo Beach murders. Now, I'm putting the picture of Nikki Bass, who was on TikTok and on the interview. She's blonde now, but she, she's changed her hair a lot because, of course, she's a hairstylist now. She's a former sex worker, escort, right, and, and former addict. And she, I'm saying that because... Um, she was like, I hated how these articles are just like a sex worker and addict. Like, whoa, she's come a long way. She's put a lot of hard work into her life. And she's now a hairstylist. And I just mean, like, I wonder if her hair was more reddish like it is in this picture then. Because we know that Rex was looking up redheads. You know what I mean? And he was trying to go. He went on a date with her. Apparently, they went to Steam House, I think it was called, for a meal. And then she was like not comfortable with him, right? So, I'm just leaning towards him. He might not like a type. I think his type is, is, is sex workers, <laughs> you know. But based on his Google searches, I'm like, oh, interesting. Anyway, so what happened in 2020 to 2022 was the pandemic. So, I don't know what that means for him and his activities or if he was at home a lot or if he really was forced into some kind of cool off period then or what. Anyway, so they say land registry documents revealed that Rex Hureman purchased $154,000 worth of land in Chester in 2021 with his neighbors saying that he had planned to create a compound with his brother who lives in the high security property. And they were kind of like doomsday prepping or building a hunting type cabin. I don't know. I've seen two different ways they describe this, but it's interesting nonetheless. July 13, 2023, he was arrested. So that's what we know. Venus Gale says, I find it odd that no one can find out anything about how his dad died. I also want to know. I really want to know. And then, of course, we know in 2023, he was still buying burner phones. Like, he was busy buying a burner phone. And he was searching on Google. We don't know the date of that, but it says serial killers by state 2023. So it seemed like quite recent Google searches from 2022 when the new task force was there to now. Why could law enforcement not trace the calls made by the Long Island serial killer? Why hasn't the Long Island serial killer been caught? Long Island serial killer. Phone call. All of these we've gone over before. We've done an entire read through of the probable cause affidavit. If you missed it, it's in the video section or on the playlist, right? Okay. Damn, we talk a lot here. <laughs> it's a lot, right? I'm trying to not overwhelm you either. So we looked at this timeline last time of the Gilgo Four and when they went missing and Shannon Gilbert. And her case is still a mystery to me. I mean, they just, the police are just like, oh, she, she ran into the marsh and died due to like mental health, you know, falling victim to the elements. But it, it's an interesting case nonetheless. And because she went missing, the searches began and they, they found all these other bodies. So we've gone through this in the last episode and... Maybe you could check that out if you want to go through that slower. We've gone through all of this. The phone calls, the taunting phone calls, and everything. Okay. Yes, his dad was 50. So all of the victims of the Gilga 4 were found 22 to 33 feet, 6 to 10 meters from the edge of the parkway. They were bound by belts or tape. They were all petite sex workers who had advertised on Craigslist and also Backpage. I saw an interesting video today from the... A and E, the killing season episode on the Long Island serial killer producer. And they were saying that somebody had called them to say that they think it's John Bissett, not Bitrolf, Bissett, the aquarium owner guy, the nursery or the nursery owner, aquarium owner, but had access to burlap bags. That guy, they, they, they think it's him. And people are now comparing the voices. To me, it doesn't sound quite the same as Rex, but that's interesting nonetheless. I don't know if you've seen that. We can't look at it right now. <laughs> we're going to just go on for hours if we do, right? We'll look at that another time. How about that? So they were all between 22 and 27 and missing clothing and personal possessions. 
So that's what we know about the Gilga 4. And as we go now, we're going to be building on looking at all the other victims in this area too. And then we'll expand from there. So we've done a deep dive on the Gilga 4. A few times actually, right? And Shannon Gilbert's case. That's all in the playlist. So now what I've circled there is new information has come out about Jessica Taylor and Valerie Mack. In that they were bound in a way that a hunter would find them. It's very interesting as well that an unidentified female toddler was found near Valerie Mack's body. But the toddler's mother was found in Lakeview, New York. Oh wait, a different area. Like, it's so strange. There's a lot of strange things. We still have to deep dive here. Again, this is only like layer two. But the new information that's come out is that they say the leg area was bound in a ball. You'd have to be a hunter or something like that. Their knees were brought into their chest area. So that starts to become interesting, which is why I wanted to go over the new information that Rex was actually a hunter. And we're not just talking about shooting ducks like a bear hunter. This guy's hunting bears? Oh my word. Okay. What else is he hunting? I don't know, but he's bragging about it. And so I hope it all makes sense now in the big picture based on, well, could this be someone else? Because John Bitroll, for instance, was also a hunter. Okay. So could there be two hunters and two serial killers operating in the same area or dis um, dropping bodies, discarding bodies in the same area? Sure. It can. It can. Because it's about a three mile stretch. It's possible. But... As the district attorney said, with these two victims, they're looking at Bitrolf, but they are not ruling out Rex Hureman. They're looking at both of them right now, is the point. Okay, Jessica Taylor. The remains of Jessica Taylor, an escort working in New York City, were located in a wooded area in Manneville on July 26, 2003. Additional remains of Taylor were discovered on March 29th. Look at the dates, 2011, along Ocean Parkway. Some remains in Manneville, some remains Ocean Parkway, Gilgo Beach. That's quite something, isn't it? Missing in Africa. Thank you so much. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Love to South Africa. If you guys didn't know, that's where I'm from. I'm South African, uh, living in the Netherlands. I lived in South Africa for 35 years. <laughs> okay, now Manneville Jane Doe. Jane Doe number six, Valerie Mack. Valerie Mack, an escort whose last known whereabouts was in Philadelphia in 2000, was identified through genetic genealogy in 2020 as the victim whose remains were discovered on two separate occasions in Manneville in 2000 and Oak Beach in 2011. So this, whoever murdered them, dismembered them and put the body parts in different places. Now remember, John Bitrolf was also known at some point as like the Manneville butcher and he was operating that area. And he liked to pose the bodies and things like that. So could this be the work of him? Could it be Rex? Or could it be someone else? We just don't know. Oh, thank you so much, Laura. I really appreciate it. And Hasina says, Dr. Hackett is such a red flag in my mind. <laughs> I know, right? Dr. Hackett, especially for Shannon Gilbert's case. <laughs> He's a red flag. He definitely is. I don't know if you guys saw all that, right? Okay, so that's that's interesting. Let's see what else I've got on here. Okay, so then I was also like, wait, wait, wait. I need to remind myself and maybe all of us. Who are the 10 victims found? And I added Shannon Gilbert, because then he's 11, on this stretch of beach. Maureen Brainard Barnes, Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello. The, the, the Gilgo four. Three out of the four found in Burlap. Maureen Brainard Barnes not. Maureen was the first one to go missing. And the one that's pending as a charge for Rex Hureman. Right? We don't know that it will definitely be, but that'll be very strange if it isn't. That's really going to be interesting. So then there's Valerie Mack, Jessica Taylor, there's Fire Island Jane Doe, which is where the boat theory comes in. And an unidentified Asian male. There's Peaches, who disappeared in 1997. And an unidentified female toddler who's actually Peaches baby. Okay? And Shannon Gilbert. So... That is what we have so far. Let me quickly see the time. It's almost interview time for me. Okay, so 
uh, Sarah CD says, watching from the beginning, but I was in the Air Force. They put aerospace before all job titles. I was an aerospace medical service specialist, which is AF Talk for an EMT. Ah, thank you so much. Now, Papa Bear said, in the U.S., only one permit is required for any or all handguns. So he would have one permit. Okay, wait, wait. Oh, he would have one permit for all 92 handguns. The U.S. doesn't require a permit for any other guns. Oh, so that's not even a big deal that people have been like, oh, my already only. Well, he had like, what, 290. I don't remember the exact number. Almost 300 guns, all different types. And people were saying it's it's a bit too much for a duck hunter, but now we know he's also a bear hunter and a, probably a deer hunter. If he's hunting bears and shooting ducks, you can imagine everything in between, right? Okay. So, that's what we have there. There's one more thing that, well, there's actually a lot that I would want to show you, but I am running out of time for today because I've got other appointments. <laughs> can I believe it? <laughs> so, otherwise we'd be here all night, but we can meet again. Um maybe on Sunday or over the weekend, I definitely want to make more episodes for you uh, and bring you the interview that I'm going to be conducting in the next half an hour or so. So I just want to show you quickly the map. Okay, so let's just do some map time quickly. Let's do this and go here. Okay, and we are back. Now let's get it on the screen. There we go. So, <laughs> sorry, I've got to size it for you. Let's do a little bit of map time quickly, just so we can, I, I hope it helps you visually, because I look at this all the time and I'm like, oh, <laughs> it certainly helps me to be like, I can't picture it without all the map time and everything. Like, what are we looking at, guys? So I just wanted to see, well, especially the beaches. So I'm not going to look at everything today. But Fire Island, Jane Doe wanted to look at where all the bodies were. And then also the beaches that we've just looked at that um, Rex was associated with, obviously, by the, this Tobe Beach is this was or is one of the school's favorite beaches, apparently. I would say, damn, start checking the areas around here. If if Rex, <laughs> you know, was feeling dark towards people who bullied him in school, if this was their favorite beach, you know what I mean? So Tobey Beach is here and Ocean Parkway already starts. Well, it's already here. And then oh, thank you, Estelle. Let's quickly go. Here's the Jones State Jones Beach State Park, where Rex worked for a bit. Like, cleaning up and just working on the beach a little bit. Around 1981-ish, after he graduated, right? They said for several years, so I'm not sure how long exactly. But working there, they, they didn't want to comment, really. They just said, yes, yes, he worked there. So if he worked here, and also here on this Tobey Beach, if he was around there and frequented the beach, as Billy Baldwin said, well... If the bodies then were found here, this is Gilgo Beach, and here's where the bodies were found. Amber, Melissa, Megan Waterman, Amber, Costello. Where'd the name go now? Melissa, there we go. Sorry. Amber Costello, Melissa Bartholomew, Maureen Brainard Barnes, and Megan Waterman. That's where their bodies were discovered. Okay. And then, if we go a little further on the beach here, we've got to go this way a little bit. More. Oh, <laughs> wait. Oh, I didn't put those on yet. That's not like, where is it? Sorry, the others were around this area. So could somebody be dumping bodies here and somebody else here? Sure. Is it very likely? Maybe not. I don't know what to think. But it, could it be? Yeah, it could be. And then... Fire Shannon Gilbert was last seen here. And where's that Fire Island Jane Doe? Fire Island Jane Doe was found along here? That's a Jane Doe that's part of the, the 10 victims found on this stretch? So I'm just saying there's a whole stretch, especially with this meaning for Rex, you know, Tobey Beach and Jones Beach. I think that should, I'm sure it's all being checked, but like check again, <laughs> right? You just never know what you're all going to discover along here. Interesting, right? So that's that. We can go over all of these another time, like exactly 
who, when, where were they last seen and all of that. It's still another deep dive. That's another layer. This is just an overview today just to show you the beaches we were referring to and where the bodies were found. And you can see on this map I have where everyone was last seen, meaning the Gilga 4, where they were last seen. And we did quite a deep dive there as well. So I hope you find that helpful. Just for a visual, just for a quick, quick map time. Oh man. And do you think they were actually looking for Shannon Gilbert? And they started going this way and then eventually found a body. And then two days later, whoa, three more bodies? That that must have been so hectic. And none of them were Shannon Gilbert. Can you imagine? Janet Murphy says Long Island Dumping Beach. I mean, they say this road is so dark at night. Maybe they should put a lot of lights there. Now, especially. <laughs> right? Okay. So... I think that's what I have for you. I just quickly want to check here because there were two videos that I did want to quickly show you. But I I think it's getting a bit long now. So we'll look at that another time. One was the district attorney. I'll link them in the description box for you in case you're curious, okay? One was the, the district attorney saying DNA evidence found in Gilgo Beach murders is very powerful. They also described the search as very fruitful at the house. And just answering some questions, which make it sound like for now, of course, they also said this at the press conference, they're focusing on the Gilgo 4. That's, you know, Rex Yerman, Gilgo 4. And then they expand from there. So I will link that for you. Thank you so much for being here for the deep dive today. I hope that you, yeah, Dieter, I hope that you guys enjoyed it. I hope that it makes sense. And uh, you can see what I'm doing, that every time we get more information, I'm just going to be adding to that. And I want to see eventually all these different phases of his life. And eventually we can look at other cases too. We also start with, okay, the Gilga 4 and everything about it. And then we expand from there too, right? Okay. <laughs> so thank you so much, everyone. I will see you in the next one. If I missed any stickers or members joining or anything, I will check it out now. I normally do. I go behind the scenes here. Uh, let me quickly check the stickers while I'm doing that. So, thank you to Estelle, Laura, Missing in Africa, Bonnie, Dana for the Watermelon Fund, Stephen Lennon, thank you so much, Liz G, Miranda Wrights, Lily, Grindelwald, Gerda, Jinxie, Susan, Laura, Dolly Daydream, another Laura, and Pistol Amy, Lenny, and you said a coffee for poor, tired Dita. That was from yesterday. 